go with me to the, the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. Book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter uh, 39. We're continuing our series on walking in divine favor. And one of the greatest examples uh, in the Old Testament of God's divine favor being manifested in the life of an individual has to be Joseph. And in uh, Genesis chapter 39, we're going to read verses 1 uh, through 5. And we're going to talk about how we can maintain the favor of God in our lives. It's one thing to be a recipient of God's favor uh, because of the fact that we're born again. Uh, every born again believer is a recipient of God's divine favor. Uh, but as we talked about the last night we were together, there's a difference in that which we receive as a result of our born again experience and that which we cultivate as we uh, press into God and seek God with everything that we have. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today. I want to talk to you about how we can maintain the favor of God in our lives. I believe that, that Joseph demonstrates for us in, in very clear fashion uh, what we must do to make sure that that favor that we started with is maintained in our lives. Let's read there in Genesis chapter 39. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in, the eye, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Hallelujah. We have defined favor as God's demonstrated delight. And, and we stated uh, a couple of weeks ago that the favor of God is, is something that's tangible. Uh, when God's favor rests, rule, and, and abides upon your life, it's something tangible that can be seen by others. In our text this morning, we see that Potiphar observed that there was favor on the life of Joseph when he was Joseph's slave. And God, he observed something tangible. There was some tangible manifestation of the favor of God in his life. And it was so tangible that uh, uh, Potiphar was able to see that there was favor upon him. And the result of noticing that favor, it says that Potiphar put him over everything in his household, both in the house and in the field. And so uh, Potiphar was blessed as a result of God's tangible favor being on the life of Joseph. And none of that was in my notes. When we favor somebody, we want to be with him, with them. When we favor someone, we want to spend more time with them than we do with everyone else. When we favor someone, we, we usually favor those who favor us. Uh, uh, and, and this is what we're seeing in the scripture today. In the same way, God shows favor to the ones who delight in connecting with him. Let me say that again, because you got to get it. In the same way, God shows favor to those who delight in connecting with him and who give him honor and glory. Let me give you some illustrations just so that you can understand. You know, next week is going to be the Super Bowl. Right now, Tom, at U.S. Bank Stadium, unfortunately, the Vikings are not participating. Go Vikings next year. <laughs> but there is a guy who will be participating, Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. I am not a fan, uh, but he's definitely the greatest quarterback that we have ever seen in our lifetime. And Tom Brady has a favorite receiver. He's his favorite because he always catches the ball, even when the ball is not well thrown.
Rome. Tom Brady loves Gronkowski, or whatever his name is. The guy who got knocked out next week. And you know he's going to be ready on Sunday. And you know that when Tom Brady throws him a ball, no matter how difficult it might be, he's going to do everything within his ability to come down with that catch. And because he does that consistently, time after time after time, he has a favored status with Tom Brady. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Uh, another example from the, uh, from the sports arena is, is uh, uh, the, the Cleveland Cavaliers traded for a new point guard, a little diminutive guy. I think he's five foot seven. His name is Isaiah Thomas. If you've ever seen him, this guy has speed. He's got a gear that I've never seen before. And when he gets the ball, especially in transition, he's running down court. And if he doesn't have a shot, he's always looking to assist someone else. Well, if you want to receive the ball from Isaiah Thomas, then you got to make sure that when you get it, you can finish. And who finishes better than LeBron James? <laughs> King James. And so Isaiah Thomas doesn't mind distributing the ball to LeBron James because he knows that LeBron James will finish what he started. That's what, 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 what we're, we're talking about today. We're talking about God's favor being manifested in our lives. Favor was the reason that Joseph went from the pit to the palace. It was nothing but God's divine favor on Joseph's life that caused him to make that move. Favor has a way of working for us even when we don't know it's working. That's right. uh, we're oblivious to the fact that it's at work and it's only in hindsight that we see that God's favor has been manifested in our lives. For, through careful examination of the life of Joseph, I think we can see the characteristics that must be present in our lives if we want to see God's favor continually uh, demonstrated in our lives and visited upon our lives. There's five things that I think Joseph did that are instructive to us as we seek uh, to have God's favor uh, manifested in our lives. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Uh, just before we get started, turn to your neighbor, look up in the eye. And say this with me. I'm walking in divine favor. I'm a recipient of God's demonstrated delight. Doesn't that get you excited when you say that? I get excited. Come, let's try it one more time. I'm walking in divine favor. I'm walking in divine favor. Oh, there's more of you all here. Come on. I'm walking in divine favor. I'm walking in divine favor. I am a recipient. I am a recipient. Of God's demonstrated. Of God's demonstrated. Delight. delight. All right, give the Lord a hand clap. That's great. As I said earlier, I think that there's five things that Joseph did that caused him to continue to walk in God's favor. The first thing that Joseph did, Joseph was willing to change. Look at your neighbor and say, are you willing to change? Uh, look at your other neighbor and ask them, are you willing to change? If you're not willing to change, then I don't think that you're going to see an extra manifestation of God's divine favor in your life. We're introduced to Joseph through the narrative of his father, Jacob. And, and in that narrative we see in chapter 37, we see Joseph is, as a young man who is the favorite of his father. And because he was the favorite of his father, we are told that God made him a coat of many colors. Yes. And he would parade himself about in that coat. Uh, he didn't work in the field with his brothers. He didn't herd the cattle with his brothers, but he was sent by his father to spy on his brothers. He was hated because of his favoritism that his father had toward him. So Joseph grew up as an individual, as a young man that, that needed to grow in, 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 his, in his own personal um, uh, character. He needed to grow in his own personal character. When, when Joseph had a dream, he came and he shared it with his brothers. 
And his brothers, uh, after they heard the dream that their sheep came and bowed down to his sheep, uh, they, they hated him all the more. The statement of his brothers were they hated him all the more. They already hated him because he was his father's favorite. They already hated him because he had the coat of many colors. They hated him because he was not participating in the daily work. They just hated him. And then they hated him all the more when he came and he shared this dream that their sheaves bowed to his sheaves. Well, you could, could uh, uh, toss that up and say, well, uh, that was just uh, 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 Lord have mercy. Him sharing that with his brothers, you can, you can suggest that this was just not wisdom on Joseph's part. He already knew that his brothers hated him. He already knew that they had no love for him, but instead of keeping the dream to himself, maybe sharing it with his father, uh, he instead goes and shares with all of them. And you can chalk that up to inexperience, but then he has another dream. And in that dream, it's the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowing down and worshiping again. And instead of holding on to that, knowing that everyone hated him, he goes and he gathers his father and his brothers. He says, look, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bow down to worship me. Uh, Joseph was a little full of himself. I mean, y'all know somebody that's full of themselves. <laughs> All right. I mean, we all full of yourselves. Before the divine favor could be fully manifested in the life of Joseph, Joseph needed to change. Some of the arrogance and the, the, the impetuousness and, and the lack of self-discipline that he demonstrated in, 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 in relationship to the dreams that he had in sharing them with his family, some of those things needed to be worked out of Joseph before Joseph could ever really move in the favor that God wanted him to be moved in. When he was in the pit, he learned how not to be so impetuous. You know, being in the pit with no water, left to die, will stop you from being as impetuous as you are. On his trip to Egypt, after he had been sold into the hands of the Ishmaelite traders, he learned how to not be so pretentious. When he was sold as a slave to Potiphar, he learned that he should not be as arrogant as he was. Uh, when, he, when, he, when Potiphar's wife uh, uh, accused him of, of rape, he learned that he should not be so self-absorbed. In prison, he learned that his arrogance didn't serve anyone but himself. You see, Joseph was willing to change. And over the course of 13 years, or how many, how, how many years it was, or however many years it was, uh, from his entrance into Egypt until the time that he came into the palace, over those 13 years of his life, God squeezed all of that mess out of Joseph and prepared him so that he could stand in the palace next to Pharaoh. God worked some things out in his character over time so that he could accept and receive the favor of God in his life. The question this morning for us is, are you willing to change? Turn to your neighbor and look me in the eye. That's that next slide. Are you willing to change? You know, just like Joseph was willing to change, who was willing to be introspective, was willing to accept criticism from others. If we want God's divine favor to be manifested in our lives, we must be open to change. You know, no one likes to be criticized. If you like to be criticized, let me see your hand this morning. No one likes to be criticized. No one likes the, the spotlight to be turned on their lives. No one likes for uh, someone else to come and point out their shortcomings and, and, and their difficulties, uh, uh, their challenges. But if we are wanting to see a, a manifestation of God's favor in our lives, we must be willing to change. And if we're willing to change, sometimes we need to accept 
some criticism. You know, some of us just need to get rid of a little anger. Say amen if you need to get rid of some anger. All right. <laughs> uh, some of us need to let go of our fears. Some of us are lazy. God wants to deal with some of us in the areas of our insecurities. And as Joseph prospered, he knew somehow that he would prosper also. Now, Potiphar was not a believer. He didn't believe in the Most High God. He didn't pray to the same God that Joseph prayed to. But he was wise enough to see that everything that this young man puts his hand to is prospering. And so I need to put everything in his hands so that I can prosper as well with him. So, so Joseph made the best of what he did. You know, when Joseph was with Potiphar, he did everything well. He worked hard. He didn't make excuses for not showing up. Uh, he, he put himself to work and, and he called Potter to, uh, to prosper. The same thing happened when Joseph went to prison. When Joseph was in prison, uh, after he had been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, uh, look at uh, chapter 39, verses 20 and 21. Listen to what it says. He says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Wow, isn't that something? Joseph was in prison, but the Lord was with him. Now, I wouldn't have wanted to go to prison. Uh, but if I was going, I would love to know that the Lord was with me. And the Lord was with him. Again, when we get, sometimes we go through difficult, difficulties. We're not always going to have a, a bed of ease in, in our lives. Uh, there will be times of difficulty. There will be times that will stretch us to our limits. There will be challenges that we face. But the thing that we need to remember is that just because we're in a challenging situation does not mean that the favor of God has abandoned us. As a matter of fact, God is with us while we're in our difficulty. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. So he's in prison, and the warden sees. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. So Joseph made the best out of a bad situation. Are you making the best out of the situation that you find yourself in? Are you? Are you one that can be trusted to do the work? That's the next slide. Uh, are you the one can, that can be trusted to do the work that, that your boss wants you to do? Proverbs chapter 14 verse 35 says this, The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. How do you perform on your job? Are you always complaining? Looking for a way to cut corners? Leaving early? Extending your lunch break? Are you always talking badly about the person who's supervising you? Well, if you're doing that, then you're not going to find favor. You won't find it with your boss and you're not going to find it with God. Uh, how can I find favor uh, with my boss? Well, you can arrive on time. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And you can make sure you're back when your lunch is over. Uh, you can leave on time. You can, you can ask your boss regularly, hey, what can I do to help make this business prosper? I'm here at your beck and your call. Whatever I can do to make you look better, that's my desire. You know, how can I help? Uh, 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 you know, represent your boss well to others. Amen. Don't talk about your boss behind his back. That's right. All right. <laughs> so two things that Joseph did. First of all, Joseph, Joseph, uh, uh, <clears throat> man, you all help me this morning. Mm -mm. Yeah. That's a shame. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, my, my wife is not here. That's the problem. She sends her regrets. She's got that uh, virus. 
going around. So she was all clammy and sweaty, hot chills, fever last night. So I told her to, to stay home. And she listened. I thought I was really smart. <laughs> so Joseph was willing to change. Uh, secondly, Joseph made the best out of the situation that he found himself in. Third thing, this is important. Joseph refused to sin. He refused to sin. He had opportunity, but he proved. Remember when Joseph was in Potiphar's house and God had placed Joseph over everything, or, or uh, uh, Potiphar had placed him over everything that he owned. He, his wife took a liking to Joseph. Uh, I guess the, they said he was really handsome, a young Hebrew boy, and, and she began to do everything within her power to sleep with Joseph. And, and she, the, the scripture says that she pursued him not once, but it was day after day after day. And, and Joseph behaved himself in a godly manner. He wouldn't be found alone in the house with her. And he always made sure that other people were around. And, and, and the one time that he was caught alone in the house and she grabbed his garment and was going to attempt to force him into a sexual relationship, it says that Joseph let his garment go and ran out without it. He refused to compromise. I, I love what the scripture says. It says that Joseph response to Potiphar's advances was this. It says, your uh, husband has put everything in my hands. And, th and then he says, and, and how then can I do this sin and wickedness against God? Not against Potiphar. Not against myself, but how can I do this sin and this wickedness with God? So, so Joseph chose not to sin, not to compromise, and, and, and as a result of that, God's divine favor continued to rest upon his house. Even though he left part of his house and went to jail, God's favor continued to rest upon his life. Joseph didn't want to betray his master. Joseph didn't want to compromise himself. But most importantly, Joseph refused to sin against God. Are you determined not to compromise? your integrity. You know, all of us have opportunity on a daily basis to compromise our personal integrity. All of us are, are faced with opportunities that come to us to do something that we know will not be glorifying to God, will not bring honor to his name. Joseph refused to compromise himself, and, and if we want to see God's divine favor manifested in our lives, we must choose not to compromise our integrity. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Fourthly, Joseph gave the glory to God. Now, Joseph is in the prison now, and he's joined in the prison by the baker and the cupbearer to Pharaoh. And after a while, the baker and the cupbearer to Pharaoh had dreams on the same night. And the dreams so troubled them that it was obvious on their countenance when Joseph saw them the next day. And he inquired to them as to why they were so troubled. Why are your faces so sad? And when they explained to Joseph that they had had dreams that troubled them and they did not know the interpretation, Joseph didn't respond by saying, well, you know, I come from a long line of dreamers. <laughs> Abraham dreamed, Isaac dreamed, Jacob, my father dreamed, and I'm a dreamer too. Let me, let me take a stab at it. And maybe I can figure it out for you. He didn't suggest that he had had dreams as a young man himself. And he was able to accurately interpret them and uh, give me a shot and I'll interpret yours for you too. No, he said, do not interpretations belong to God. Amen. He honored God and gave God glory for what actually belonged to God. When he finally is remembered 
by the cupbearer and brought before Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh has had dreams and he's called all of the magicians here and all of the astrologers and the wise men to interpret his dream. When he's given that audience with Pharaoh, he could have used it. He could have leveraged that, that, that audience with Pharaoh to make himself rich, to find himself a position. Uh, but when he comes into Pharaoh's presence, listen to what he said. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, interpret it but I have heard it said that, he, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph's response says, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer that he desires. You know, God doesn't share his glory with anyone. It's his and his alone. And God's challenge to us as believers is that we would honor him before we honor ourselves. Joseph was faced with a situation that he could have used uh, to gain a stature, a wealth, and position within Pharaoh's kingdom, but he did not use it to promote himself. He used it instead to promote God. I was so excited when, um, uh, who's the guy that caught the football a couple of weeks ago? Minneapolis Miracle? Diggs. When Diggs caught the ball and they, he finally calmed down, he gave glory to God. I don't think God had anything to do with him catching the ball. I don't think God gets into sports all that much. <laughs> but I was thankful to see that Diggs used the situation that presented itself to him to give honor and glory to God. And, and to suggest that his athletic ability had been given by God and that he was using it to glorify God. And, and that's what we need to do in our lives. Are you willing to give God the glory that he is due? And not try to rob it or share it. You know, I've been in school a long time. And because I've been in school a long time, that's why I preach the way that I preach. No, I give God the glory. Last thing, Joseph embraced God's sovereignty. Joseph embraced God's sovereignty. <clears throat> to be sovereign means to be in complete control. Complete control. God's got it all in control. He's got it all in control. And Joseph understood that. Now, I'm sure he didn't understand it when he was in the pit. He didn't see it then. It wasn't clear to him. He probably was questioning, God, you gave me these two magnificent dreams. You showed me that I would be in a position of leadership. And now I'm in the pit. I'm sure he didn't see it when he was a slave in Potiphar's house. Lord, I'm serving a heathen. Lord God, whoa, whoa, whoa. how are you sovereign? How are you in control? Uh, I'm sure he didn't see it when he was thrown into the prison. And, and when he was away from his family for all of that time, he, he, he probably was not aware of it. But in God's sovereignty, God was working something out. Not only was he working something out for, for, for Israel, for his brethren, but he was working something out for Joseph as well. When his brothers finally come into Egypt because of the famine that's in the land and they're searching for food, Joseph, who had been sold into Egypt by them, confronts them face to face and they don't know who he is. What an opportunity for vengeance. Grab him, take him out, flog him, beat him, you know, question them one by one. Uh, he, could, he could have visited his wrath upon each and every one of them, but he, but he didn't. And after his father finally dies in Egypt, his brothers are terrified. And, and they come and they say, remember that, that, the, that our father swore you to not hurt us. And, and listen to Joseph's response. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what, he is, what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children 
And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. He finally had embraced the sovereignty of God. It was God's plan. Man, I don't understand it. That he be thrown into the pit. God used the hatred that his brothers had toward him to set in motion a plan that would save his entire house. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways beyond finding out. I don't understand God. But if we bow to his sovereignty in our lives, we know that ultimately, what? That all things are going to work together for the good to them that love God and to them who have been called in accordance with his purpose. Amen. From the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison and finally to the path. The sovereignty of God. Do you believe that God really has the whole world in his hands? Do you believe that? Or do you feel like you need to help God from time to time? I think we've all been guilty of that at one point in time in our lives. Lord, I'm going to help you out. You take it just a little bit too long. I, I can remember uh, when I first got saved and no one else in my family uh, had a relationship with the Lord and I was witnessing and sharing my faith at every opportunity with my, my family members. My, when I was down preaching at the church that my brother attends, he reminded me of that when he was introducing me. He says, yeah, he said, my brother kept telling me that I needed to get right with God. He just didn't realize I wasn't ready yet. <laughs> but I would constantly witness to them and, and I didn't want to see any of my family die without Christ. You know, I, I knew I was on my way to heaven and I wanted them, them to go with me. Uh, and, and I thought God was taking too long. I thought he was just taking too long. And, and uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget my, my parents were having a bridge meeting. And I was upstairs and, and um, not a bridge meeting, you know, bridge, playing bridge. They pulled the car tables out and they had, and they'd play bridge and they moved from table to table, never understood bridge. But anyway, all of my relatives were downstairs, and uh, I'm, I'm upstairs, and, and so I said, I'm going to go down and witness to them. Well, not the right time to witness to my family, because my family are drinkers. And at, at the bridge, they all, they had their, their um, what was that, whiskey. Uh, they had the, well, I can't remember the name of it, but they had the whiskey, they had the beer, they, they were lit. I, I don't know how they played cards because they were so high, you know. And, and but I, you know, I decided I'm gonna go down there. I'm gonna tell them about Jesus. <laughs> Why they're drunk? So I prayed a little bit, not a lot, because if I prayed hard enough, God probably would have not the right time. So. <laughs> not the right time. I prayed a little. And I, I marched down the stairs, and they're right in the middle of bridge now. You know, they're playing, they're having a good time, they're laughing. My dad has the stereo turned all the way up, listening to jazz. They're just having a ball. And, and I just walked in and bowled. You know, I lifted up the, that's when they had needles and record players. I lifted up the needle and set it off. That, that already, I was already in trouble with my dad at that point. Because I stopped the music. Everybody stopped and looked at me and I, I started preaching. I'll never forget my, my Uncle Lewis got up. Walked over to me and said, shut up, boy. Go sit down somewhere. And I was afraid of my Uncle Lewis. He was shorter than I was, but he was a bad dude. And guess what I did? I shut up and went and sat down. After put the music back on. No, I didn't put the music back on. My, my father didn't want me to touch the stereo. My point is, I was trying to help God. Now, in due season, everybody that came over there for bridge gave their hearts to Jesus. But it's God's timing and not ours. Uh, are you willing to embrace God's sovereignty in your life? Uh, well, one more example from my life. I got saved and immediately felt the call of God in my life to preach. 
And um, I was at Faith Temple Church of God in Christ in Evanston, Illinois, and there were lots of preachers at that church, and I was waiting for my opportunity. You know, I would sit with the preachers, you know, and some of them would get an opportunity, and I'd sit there, I'd critique them. I said, this man can't preach. I said, he can't preach his way out of a wet paper bag. He's terrible. I, I could do better than that, you know. I just impatient. I, I just wanted, but God needed to work some stuff out of me. You know, he gave me a vision of a, a, a pastor in a multicultural church when I was 18 years old. Didn't happen until I was 44 years of age. Well, why? Because God was getting me ready so that I could accept his favor on my life. I need to surrender to his sovereignty in me. So how do we maintain our faith? We need to be open to making changes in our life. We do. I know God speaks to you about changes that you need to make because he speaks to me on a regular basis about changes that I need to make in my life. We, we, if we want to see God's favor in our lives, we must be open to making the best out of the situation that we find ourselves in. You know, it's not always time to cut and run. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes you need to stay put and let God deal with the situation for you. Stay put. We're so quick to run. You know, when things get tight, we're so quick to run away from the situation where God wants us to stay put so that not only can he bring us out eventually, but he can work some things out of us in the process. Third thing, refuse to compromise your integrity. Refuse to compromise in any area of your life. Refuse when the opportunity presents itself for you to compromise. Just say no. Refuse to compromise. Be willing to give God the glory. And as God begins to prosper you and begins to open things up in your life, be willing to give God the glory. And last but not least, embrace God's sovereignty in your everyday life. Just before we close, let me give this illustration. Ask the ushers to get ready. Chef Jeff. I met Chef Jeff when we were in Northeast Assembly. Matter of fact, I was at the first dinner that Chef Jeff cooked. It was a Valentine's Day dinner down at the basement. And Chef Jeff always had a vision and a plan to see Chef Jeff Catering. I don't even know if you called it Chef Jeff Catering back then. Expand and grow. And he always had that piece where I'm using what I know so that I can be a blessing to the people around me. And I can share Christ as a result of the relationship that I, I have with them. And, and I saw Chef Jeff over the years, and we've, we've always been great friends. And, and I saw him struggle. I, I saw him uh, uh, still keeping the vision before him but struggling all the while. And, and the favor of God was on his life. Uh, because everyone that worked with Chef Jeff, Chef Jeff told them about Jesus. He lived it in front of them, he, he demonstrated it with his attitude, and he shared with them verbally about his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everyone that came through, that, that met Chef Jeff, knew that Chef Jeff Caden wasn't just about making food. It was about building relationships that will last throughout eternity. Well, over the last couple of years now, Chef Jeff Catering has been growing by leaps and bounds. Amen. 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 That's a direct result, in my opinion, of God's divine favor resting on Chef Jeff's life. And for Chef Jeff making decisions that he's, he's, he's uh, making the decisions that were made in Joseph's life. Uh, he's willing to change. 
You know, he, 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 he's, he's not going to compromise his own personal integrity. He can adapt to the situations and the circumstances that he finds himself in. He's going to give God the glory. And he respects God's sovereignty. This year, Chef Jeff Catering is catering for one of the airports where private jets come in. Next Sunday. Well, how did all that happen? I believe that it happened because God's divine favor, his demonstrated delight, is at work in Chef Jeff's life. He's rolling with the punches. I know that. I know the work is on him, but, but this Sunday, he'll be at the airport in the morning, all the way through to the evening, when they fly in and when they fly out, and he's going to be making oodles and oodles of money. <laughs> he's going to have to carry it out with buckets. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't want any. But it's because God's favor is resting on his life. Well, it can be the same for each and every one of us. If we're willing to allow the principles that were established in the life of Joseph to be at work in our lives as well. Be willing to make changes. Be open to making the best out of the situations that you find yourself in. Refuse to compromise your integrity. Give God the glory that's due Him. And surrender to the sovereignty of God in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, that you want us to maintain the favor in our lives. that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that that favor is maintained as we apply these basic principles to our existence. Lord, I pray for each and every person here that is a believer. And as believers, Lord God, we are recipients of God's divine favor. But Lord, we all want to see a greater manifestation of his favor in our lives. So Father, we are open for change. Lord, we will make the best of the situation that we find ourselves in. Father, we won't compromise our integrity. We'll give you the glory. Lord God, we will recognize your sovereignty in our particular situation and circumstances. And Lord, as we do those things, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in advance for your favor attending our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed. The first step to being a recipient of God's divine favor is embracing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Those of us that have asked Him to come into our heart and forgive us of our sins are walking in His favor. And you can do that this morning as well. Just simply by making a decision and asking him to come into your heart and change your life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want to take it for granted that everybody's saved. If things are not right between you and the Lord and you would like this morning to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Invite him into your heart and to ask him to forgive you of your sins. We'd love to pray for you this morning. Just slip your hand up so that we can pray for you. See that hand. See 
that hand. Anyone else this morning? this prayer with me out loud. And I know the two individuals who raised their hand and I know they're making recommitments, but pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know that I have sinned. And I know that my sin has separated me from you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, today I invite you to come into my heart and change my life. From this day forward, from this day forward, I will live for you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.